So Psalm 83 on uh, page 518. A song, a psalm of Asaph. God, do not keep silent. Do not be deaf, God. Do not be quiet. See how your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have acted arrogantly. They devise clever schemes against your people. They conspire against your treasured ones. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation so that Israel's name will no longer be remembered. For they have conspired with one mind. They form an alliance against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebal, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre. Even Assyria has joined them. They lend support to the sons of Lot. Selah. Deal with them as you did with Midian, as you did with Sisera and Jabin at the Kishon River. They were destroyed at Endor. They became manure for the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, and all their tribal leaders like Zabar and Zalmanah who said, let us seize God's pastures for ourselves. Make them like tumbleweed, my God, like straw before the wind, as fire burns a forest, as a flame blazes through mountains. So pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Cover their faces with shame so that they will seek your name, O Lord. Let them be put to shame and terrified forever. Let them perish in disgrace. May they know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over the whole earth. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> On the inside of, inside of the notice sheet, uh, there's um, a sermon outline there and some, some questions, and I hope you've uh, taken the time to read the, the front um, cover of the bulletin. Now, Psalm 83 is the last of the 12 psalms ascribed to Asaph, or at least an Asaph, because there was uh, three uh, at least in the Bible. Uh, one was a temple musician appointed by David and probably wrote most of the psalms bearing his name, uh, but some believe this psalm and at least Psalms 74 and 79 were written later, uh, perhaps even during the exile. Many of these psalms um, are laments concerning the condition of the nation of Israel, especially with reference to being threatened by opposing nations. In some cases, they were laments concerning the people of God in captivity. Uh, But most of these laments are accompanied by hope, hope in the Lord. And so it is in this last psalm um, of Asaph. As with many of the Psalms, we are unsure of the particular setting of this one. It's clear that the nation is surrounded by enemies, uh, but regarding a specific event, we're not sure. Some ten nations are mentioned in the Psalm as opposing, uh, actually surrounding, encircling the people of God. Uh, There's no uh, record of this happening, but uh, 2 Chronicles um, chapter 20, which we had part of read earlier, I would have liked to have the whole chapter read, but that might have taken a bit long. (coughs) Um, It's a bit like this, and it certainly fits with unbelievable victories. Um, Though only a few of the nations are mentioned in Psalm 83, maybe it only lists, uh, in 83 are only recorded in 2 Chronicles 20, Uh, maybe it only lists a sample of the troublemakers. Or, on the other hand, it's possible that this psalm mentions these ten nations as a kind of historical survey to poetically describe Israel's history, Uh, namely that they were constantly under threat. And they were and have been and continue to be surrounded by those who desire to wipe them off the map. In this psalm, we will learn something about the historical and biblically significant reality of Israel being constantly opposed as a people. And this is helpful for us as the new Israel of God, which is what Paul calls us in Galatians 6.16. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ, ever since its beginning in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago, has had a history somewhat like this psalm. The church has been the object of many attacks, ultimately by Satan, in order to blot it from the face of the earth, 
Uh, But like Israel, the church still remains. And in fact, the church continues to increase. And it will continue to do so. Uh, Also, like Israel, the church at times finds itself desperately crying out to God. Crying out to God for help. And sometimes he seems to be indifferent. Uh, Both local churches and us as individuals sometimes experience this. This psalm should give us some insight into how to respond, what to pray for, and as well as what to expect. So before we get into it properly, let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, as uh, Phil said earlier, um, without you, without your guidance, without your Holy Spirit, um, your word is meaningless to us. Uh, Thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you that we can hear your word um, so freely. Father, I pray that today that my words will be your words and that your people um, here will hear you, hear what you have to say to them. For your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. And so the the psalm is divided simply into two sections, verses 1 to 8 and then verses 9 to 18. So we're at point one, surrounded by scoundrels. Um, Verses 1 to 8 highlight the particular enemies surrounding Israel. Israel is encircled by an unholy alliance dedicated to its destruction. Um, But it also contains their cry for help, and it begins with this cry from Asaph. God, do not keep silent. Do not be deaf. God, do not be quiet. That's bold praying, isn't it? It is, in fact, faithful praying. This verse is spoken um, with a boldness of faith, which knows that it might speak freely to Almighty God. The more that you know God, the more that you can speak freely to him. This is an example of insolent irreverence, though, is it? No, it reveals the heart of someone who takes God, his word and his purposes seriously, very seriously. And what follows proves this. But before looking at this, we should pause to consider the silence of God that Asaph calls out. The Bible contains many examples of his people overwhelmed by troubles while God seems to be silently sitting by. But of course, that's an unfair conclusion. God in his sovereign wisdom runs the universe according to his perfect clock, not to that one that he wound up and threw out into space. I think of the Israelites who were in Egypt for uh, 400 years and most of those years they suffered as slaves. Where was God and what was he doing? Well, he was working his plan, the plan that he told Abraham about in Genesis 15. When the time was right, God heard their cries in the sense of responding wisely and powerfully. God's timing is always perfect. Uh, Job experienced this too, didn't he? And, and by the way, the Lord didn't give Job any insight into the whys and hows of his ordeals. God remained silent about that. Job didn't get the behind the scenes uh, that we do when we read about him. Job knew the Lord and that was sufficient for him to rest in his sovereign. Our church history is often like this and we find ourselves in trouble at the hands of those who want to destroy or at least stop the work of God. We continue to labour and to live trusting God, yet he seems silent. So how should we respond? Well, with bold praying, with bold prayers. Uh, But you might wonder what guards bold praying from becoming brash and belligerent praying. And the answer is found in verses 2 to 5. <clears throat> See how your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have acted arrogantly. They devise clever schemes against your people. They conspire against your treasured ones. They say, come, let's wipe them out as a nation so that Israel's name will no longer be remembered. For they have conspired with one mind. They form an alliance against you. And we're at point two, and a God-centred concern. Asaph's concern in this psalm is not primarily for himself or for Israel, but for God. Did you notice the use of the second person? Your enemies, those who hate you, schemes against your people, against your treasured ones. 
an alliance against you. Even in verse 4, the tone is that of concern about the nation of Israel being wiped out. The nation of Israel was uniquely God's possession. Asaph is concerned about God. Uh, We'll see this God-centered concern again later, but this is precisely the point. The plea for God to break his silence is due to a concern, a passionate concern, for the glory of God's name. And so it should be for the church of our day, so it should be for this church and for each one of us. When we, the church of Jesus Christ, are surrounded by scoundrels who clearly hate the Lord, when we see the arrogance of God rejectors conspiring to overthrow his rule, when we see the attempts to shut down God's church and to cut off its influence, then for the glory of God's name we must pray with boldness. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace. Do not be still, O God. And it's clear in places like Yemen and Nigeria, Somalia, Iran and, and most of the stands, there is a concerted effort to cut off the church, to annihilate Christianity from the face of the earth. The horrendous butchering of God's people must disturb us. They are our brothers and sisters. But what of the contempt that this shows for Almighty God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus? This should stir us to call God to action. This sense of reverent desperation should permeate our prayers. We're often too focused on the temporal matters of health and and work and the like. Now, without dismissing these legitimate concerns, we must be more passionately committed to the honouring of God's name in our lives and the lives of others by spreading his fame as sinners believe in Jesus. Uh, We're at point three now, and it's encircled by foes. And in verses six to eight, it identifies the scoundrels who seek to wipe Israel off the world map. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebal, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, even Assyria has joined them. They lend support to the sons of Lot. Selah. It's interesting to note the enemies that are listed here. The Edomites were the offspring of Esau. For hundreds of years they sought the demise of Israel. The Ishmaelites, like the Edomites, were family to the children of Abraham, but they were hostile and estranged. The Moabites traced their lineage to Lot. Again, we see that family connection. The Hagrites were on the east of Israel and at one time had been a major thorn in the, in the side of the tribes of Manasseh and Gad. Uh, the identity of, of Gebal is uncertain, but perhaps they were near what today is known as Beirut. The Ammonites, like the Moabites, were distantly related through Lot. The Amalekites, who also traced their roots to Esau, were from the earliest days a constant enemy to the people of Israel. Philistia and Tyre, Philistines who were located along what we might call the Gaza Strip and up to Lebanon. Assyria, of course, would conquer the northern tribes and carry them off as captives. Uh, If you look at a map of that day, you will see that these ten nations literally surround, encircle Israel. Clearly there was good reason for Asaph to cry out, to pray to God. The people of God were surrounded by the enemies of God and apart from the Lord's help, they were hopelessly helpless. Um, shortly we'll read the imprecations, there's that big word, <clears throat> of Asaph concerning God's enemies. Yet his desire was not so much their destruction, but their conversion. And this should be how we approach this type of situation, wherever it is occurring. Yes, we are disturbed by the ungodliness of those who oppose the church, who oppose God. But ultimately, we're all related through Adam. And Paul highlights this in Acts 17. The point is that we should feel deep pity for those who oppose God, while at the same time feeling great disgust at what they're doing. This is why we should both pray for converts to come from the countries that I mentioned and from around us here, as well as for judgment upon those who will not be transformed by the gospel. A human flourishing is a term that we hear a bit. 
And it's a good concept and one that we probably should desire. Uh, But people need to experience the power of the gospel to flourish as God intended. Um, We're at point four now. In the second half of the psalm, verses 9 to 18, the prayer becomes imprecatory. As Asaph pleads for justice, he asks the Lord to intervene, to defeat God's enemies. But the prayer is not a hopeless lament. It's rather rooted soundly in historical events in which the sovereign Lord delivered his people from the enemies. And surely if the Lord would and could do that then, he will and can do it in Asaph's time, and he will and can do it now. And we all need this conviction. Verses 9 to 12 remind us of God's strength in our weakness. Deal with them as you did with Midian, as you did with Sisera and Jabin at the Kishon River. They were destroyed at Endor. They became manure for the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb and all their tribal leaders like Zabar and Zalmanah, who said, let's seize God's pasture for ourselves. Now, Asaph could have chosen, as um, Seamus so well did, any number of past victories in which the Lord gave amazing and undeserved victories, um, particularly from the book of Judges. But he chose two particular ones from that record, and I think for a significant reason. Let's look at the two he chose. Uh, Gideon's lanterns. The first victory is that of Gideon over Midian, as recorded in Judges 7 and 8. Uh, He mentions this in verse 9, and then he comes back to it again in verses 11 and 12. You might remember the account when God whittled down Gideon's army of 32,000 to a mere 300. And even those 300 did not need to bloody their swords. For the Lord sent such terror among the Midianites that they ended up killing each other. If there was ever a case of friendly fire destroying an army, this was it. Later, Gideon then killed four well-known Midianite rulers, Oreb, Zeb, Zebar, and Zalmanah. What is remarkable is that this victory was almost unprecedented, perhaps only by that uh, one that Seamus told us about in the defeat of the Egyptian army in the waters, uh, and by human standards, completely unlikely. Uh, Even when the walls of Jericho fell, the Israelites still had to attack the city and kill the inhabitants. But here, 300 men with their lanterns defeated thousands with the best weaponry of the day without even raising a hand. Uh, And then we have Jael's nail. The second reference comes from the record of Judges 4 and 5 and concerns the defeat of Jabin, the king of the Canaanites, by the conquest of Sisera, his military leader and his army. The Canaanite army had some 900 chariots. They were scary. It made it the most powerful army of its day, but not powerful enough to to defeat God and his purposes. The Lord heard the cries of his people and gave them an unlikely victory. He used Deborah and Barak to, to rout Sisera and his army. As Sisera fled, he sought refuge, rest, and food in the home of a woman named Jael. She fed him, and then while he was sleeping, gave him a splitting headache. Read Judges 4 if you don't know. The account concludes, that account concludes with, that day God subdued King Jabin of Canaan before the Israelites. This is why Asaph reminds those who are singing this psalm of these events. He wanted them, and God wants us to remember what he has done in the past concerning the progress of his kingdom and the glory of his name. The entire victory belonged to the Lord. Asaph's leaving out the names of the judges just reinforces that the primary deliverer was the Lord himself. This truth encourages us that when things look humanly hopeless, that we need to look up. I'm sure that things looked really bleak to the people of Israel when the Midianites kept looting their lands. And when the Canaanites did the same. But in each instance, God stepped in and gave a remarkable, unbelievable victory. Asaph wanted God's people to remember this so that they would look up 
We need the same. The kingdom of God is always under assault, yet we must look up to God who has already won the victory. We should look up scripture and remember what God has done and then be encouraged by what he can do. We should also look up scripture to read his promises of what he will do. Second, we need to look up and set our gaze upon the Lord rather than upon our enemies. No, we don't ignore them, that would be foolish, but we are not to focus on them. <coughs> Excuse me. The pleas of the verses 13 to 15 point to Asaph's conviction that God is able to sort out his enemies. Make them like tumbleweed, my God, like straw before the wind. As fire burns a forest, as a flame blazes through the mountains, so pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Now many of us are uncomfortable with such a prayer, but perhaps we shouldn't be. And here's a few reasons. Firstly, these words come from Asaph, but they are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Many psalms include these ideas and they're acceptable to God. Secondly, the motives are not personal vengeance. Rather, as we saw clearly in the opening verses, this is a plea for the vindication, for the glory of God's name. Third, such a prayer is justified by the biblical emphasis on justice. God is honoured by the punishment of evil. And it's wrong to argue that he's more honoured by mercy and grace. Both are the legitimate means of God's name being hallowed, of, his, of calling his kingdom come. Uh, as John Stott asks, why not pray intensely for that which you well know God also wants? And as several commenters, commenta, commenters have rightfully asked in a similar situation, what kind of prayer would you pray? Stott again says, we have here a normal prayer of an endangered people for which no apologies need to be made. As the psalm comes to a close, his pleading desires, sorry, his imprecatory pleading desires the honouring of God's name. And ultimately this will be the case. However, there are two possible ways that this will happen. Uh, we're at point five now and shame. In verse 16, the psalmist tempers his calls for justice with a prayer for the conversion of God's enemies. Cover their faces with shame so that they will seek your name, Lord. Although desiring deliverance and judgment, the ultimate desire of Asaph is that other people, even Israel's enemies, might come to know and obey the true God. Asaph apparently desired that the enemies of God and therefore the enemies of God's people would be humbled by God's intervention in order that they might turn to him. He prayed that once they experienced his power in judgment, they would turn to him in repentance and faith. They would then be transformed from being at enmity with him to being his friends. And that's how the gospel works, isn't it? God convicts us of our sins. We see his judgment for our sins laid on Jesus. We are ashamed at our rebellion and we respond in repentance and faith. We are then no longer enemies of God, but rather reconciled to God in Christ. Shame is powerful. It can be destructive power in leading us to further rebellion, as we'll see in a moment, or it can be a constructive power in bringing us to our knees, crying out for mercy and experiencing saving grace. Um, verses 17 to 18 are a return to that calling down of God's judgment. <clears throat> Let them be put to shame and terrified forever. Let them perish in disgrace. May they know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over the whole earth. Asaph recognised that not all of God's enemies would respond appropriately by repentance and faith. Yet he did recognise that ultimately every enemy of God will bow the knee in recognition of his lordship. Unfortunately for many it will be too late for conversion but precisely on time for condemnation. God will receive the honour due to him. And it's this assurance that surrounds Asaph even as the enemies surrounded him and his people. He was secure in knowing that the Lord would have the last word. <clears throat> 
All people would come to acknowledge his name. The ruin that they threaten God's people will recoil upon themselves. We need to remember that God's name does not only reveal his mercy, but also his justice. The people of God will always be under attack. Jesus warned that this would be the case in John 15, when he said, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. But the good news is that while our enemies might feel too powerful for us to topple, God promises to humiliate the strong by conquering them with weakness. And that leads us to the final point. While the world and the ruler of this world throughout all time has gathered its hordes and armies and militaries, God sent a child to defeat them. Unlike the armies of this world, God disarmed himself of his universal power and became a man named Jesus who was born to die. Like Jael with a humble tent peg and Gideon with his clay jars, God used Jesus' death to humiliate an empire. Not Canaan or Midian or even Rome, but the spiritual empires of death and evil that have always cruelly oppressed and killed God's people. Jesus humiliated death not by avoiding it, but by absorbing all the fury that death and the grave could muster, only to rise from his tomb. God disarmed the penultimate empire, not in an explosive display of geopolitical power, but as a powerless Jewish carpenter. In Jesus, death and those who wield it aren't just defeated, they're humiliated. Paul says in Colossians 2.15 that God disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. The world and all that God has planned for it belongs to the humble, the broken and the poor in spirit. Jesus' death has secured this truth forever. A new age of eternal victorious life has dawned and the powers of our world can do nothing to stop it. And if God was not ashamed to become a child, he will not be ashamed to include weak and humble people like us in his coming kingdom. Yes, though God's people, both Jew and Gentile, are oppressed, surrounded, there is coming a day when we will be oppressed no more. In the meantime, though we are surrounded, let us not surrender. Let us be focused on the reality that we are surrounded by a sovereign God. And because of this, we know that we are surrounded and secure. Now that is something to sing a psalm about. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you that you indeed do surround us. Uh, we are secure in you. Uh, Father, thank you that nothing that we can do uh, can change that. Father, help us to have confidence uh, in your security, but help that change us. Make us live lives that are pleasing to you and that are like the life of Jesus. Amen.